actions of Thanksgiving. What do we think of with Thanksgiving? And, and there's many answers. Maybe we think of family and, and joy and prayer, and that's good. But for many of us, Thanksgiving is going to turn into eating too much and being borderline comatose on the couch there Thanksgiving afternoon. Is, is that really what it ought to look like to give thanks to God? Now, I'm not saying that, that how we celebrate Thanksgiving is wrong, but if we are truly having an attitude of Thanksgiving, what is that going to look like? Well, let's study it out to, together. First, let's read Psalm 100. If you're there, if you'd stand with me for the reading of God's Word, if you're able. Psalm 100 and verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless him. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is true of you. We praise you that you made us, that you redeemed us by Christ's blood. We thank you for all that you give and do. Please give me the words to say in this time and move in your spirit to our hearts. We love you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so the actions of thanksgiving... This morning we're going to see to sing to the Lord. We'll see serve the Lord. We will see study the Lord. We often talk about Thanksgiving. I don't think there's anybody that would argue, oh no, we shouldn't be thankful to the Lord. That, that's a pretty indefensible position. We know it's important. But last week as we were studying in John, we saw something that really stuck out to me and I think carries over well. We saw that love, love of God and love of Christ is going to be manifested in obedience. It's going to be manifested in action. So again, if we were truly thankful to God out of our love, we should manifest that in action. That will be the mark of true thanksgiving. It needs to start with a heart attitude of true thankfulness, but it's going to work out in activity before the Lord and others. So I thought this, this favorite psalm, and it's literally titled A Psalm of Praise. That's probably a pretty good start for thanksgiving. So we're going to look at sing to the Lord, and this will be found in verses 1 and 4. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. If you are truly thankful to the Lord, you're not going to be able to keep it inside. It's going to come out with words or with song. In these five verses, well actually the first four verses, there are seven imperatives. There are seven commands to us, to make, to serve, to come, to know, to enter, to be, and to bless. So that's that idea of action. If we are thankful to the Lord, there are going to be things we are doing. The first of this is making a joyful noise unto the Lord. God doesn't want you to come and worship with a long face. You'd have to say that's a little insincere. If, if we sing some of our great hymns and and our, our face looks like we ate a lemon. That, it doesn't match up. He wants joy from us. Make a joyful noise. In, in the Hebrew, it's just one word there. And, and it's a powerful word. The idea is, is to split the ears with noise. I mean, it's not just going to be mumbling along. If we're joyful, it's going to come out with a mighty sound, a shout of joy and triumph won't be mumbling along, mouthing, playing along, or, or being forced. It's going to be spontaneous, joyful song. And as I've said before, that's one of the things I've appreciated growing up most in, in Grace Bible, that you never have to feel afraid or out of place to, to sing out to the Lord. I, I've been in churches where, where either whatever style of music they were singing, man, if you sang out, you'd, you'd be the only one. Everybody kind of you just go quiet and just kind of... To me, that, that's not sincere, that, that we're all together as a congregation letting our voices be, be melded in and making that joyful noise to the Lord, that, that we can sing out, that, that we're all singing out together. Amen. Yeah, amen. <laughs> it, it, but it just shouldn't, our worship just shouldn't be listed, okay, I got four hymns on Sunday, I'll sing and, and worship the Lord. It, it, ought to, it ought to come forth. There's a fellow we work with on the farm. I was just working with him yesterday. 
And, and you can tell when he's happy because he's humming. That sometimes we'll be working, I'm like, what's that vibration in the piece of equipment or something? No, he's just, he's humming it and it'll be loud because he's excited. And, and a lot of it's either hymns or it's joyful noise to the Lord. He is happy and excited and, and he lets it show forth. And, and that should be us. Make that joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Now it's joyful, but that joy is to be targeted. It is targeted to the Lord. He is both the object and the audience of our praise. Whenever we're singing praise, whether it's in a great congregation or whether it's by ourselves, the Lord is the audience of our praise, just as he is the audience of our prayer. So it should be directed to him. And, and that is uh, just something I, I get concerned about with, with Christian music and singing of a variety of kinds, but I think it's especially prevalent in kind of the praise and worship, and when you've got a whole worship team up here, how many people does it take to lead the congregation in, in singing? At what point does it become more of a performance to the people? And that's in praise and worship, but that can, it can happen in gospel music, any kind where suddenly become, it becomes more about others, or even if you're singing in the pew, when you become more other, worried is somebody else hearing me? Am I too loud? It's if we become worried about others instead of the praise going to God. We, we shouldn't be performative. And that's, I so appreciate our instrumentalists because they're all very good. But when we sing, the words are the important thing. There, there are some very talented instrumentalists, but, but there are so many flourishes and things that I almost have a hard time staying track on the melody, that, that they just do such a good job of, of being there to support us, but, but, but the words of praise to the Lord are the focus and the most important thing. So our praise is to God, and it should be the same whether we're alone, whether we're a crowded church, or even if we're elsewhere, out in the public. Our praise to the Lord shouldn't change. Now, I'm not saying you should burst out into a hymn in the middle of Walmart, but when you have an opportunity to praise the Lord, take it. And what is the adjective here? Make a joyful noise. It's not skillful, it's joyful. A croaking voice with love is better than a beautiful voice without love. God calls us to make a joyful noise. And I praise him that we have so many talented musicians, singers, and players. Because that's not an area I can contribute as much to the church. So I praise his gifting there. But for all of us, it is that joyful noise. He wants you to sing out whether you think you're good, whether other people think you're good or not. He wants you to, to make that joyful noise and, and just give all you can in praise to the Lord. So it's make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Is it just those that are uh, talented? Is it just those in, in our congregation? No, it's all ye lands. It's everybody. Everybody ought to praise the Lord. It was last year, the year before, Pastor Herm said... Uh, had a message of that even the atheists should be thankful for Christmas and, and Christianity. And, and whether they know it or not, even unsaved people ought to praise the Lord because he made them. Because as James 1... Well, let's turn together to James 1.17. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Every good thing on this earth is from God. Even the unsaved, the fact that they have a roof over their heads and food in their belly, whether they know it or not, it's from God. But God's people can praise him in such a greater and richer way, knowing him and being redeemed by him. We can praise him as, as creator and Savior. But we praise Him for creation, for sustaining, for provision, for life itself. Everybody ought to praise the Lord because God is the God of all the earth, whether they recognize Him as such or not. So if the whole world is to praise Him, then we should praise Him wherever we are. Whether we're in the company of believers or not, we shouldn't hesitate to say a word of praise for the Lord. We praise Him as our Redeemer. But this is true today, but, but this psalm, along with the, the previous six, they, they, they have a look forward to the millennium, to the kingdom, when this can finally come true. 
All the lands are not praising the Lord today. All peoples are not praising the Lord today. But there will come a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And on the the earth in the millennium, all people, all nations will praise the Lord. So we look forward to that. But to think that as we sing worship and praise the Lord, we're we're taking part in something that's going to be a, a high point of the kingdom. So what a wonderful blessing and opportunity that is. That we look forward to when Christ is going to be physically on the throne. And all nations of the world will come unto Jerusalem in peace and praise him. Worshipping him. What a wonderful picture and thing to look forward to that is. But we can imitate that in our lives even now. Verse 4, we're told, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. By the blood of Christ, the veil is rent and we have access to the very throne room of God. So yes, this is looking millennially that that we will go up to Jerusalem and we can enter his, his gates of the temple then. But now we can go to the very holy of holies in heaven with our prayer as well as our praise and yes many emphasize the asking nature of prayer and that is a great part of of prayer that that we are called to to make our request known to the lord and seek his work but praise needs to be part of it as well Think, think of the lord's prayer the model prayer the beginning and end are all praise to the lord hallowed be thy name blessed be your name lord then it prescribes to him the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So our prayer life into the very throne room of God, praise must be a great part of that. We ascribe it all to God. Yes, we cast our cares upon God. We make our needs, our requests known. But even in the midst of that prayer, we can praise him for what we trust he will do. Yes, we praise him for past blessings, but as we give a situation over the Lord, we just can praise him. Lord, thank you for caring about this. Thank you for, for me knowing that, that you will hear, and I praise you for what you are going to do. We praise him in light for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do by faith. Here we actually have the word thanksgiving enter his gates with thanksgiving that's the hebrew tauda we ex- it's to extend the hands to a vow to adore it's the adoration of god and that's an important point that that our thanksgiving should not just be because of of what he has done or what he re- what we receive of him it needs to be who he is that he is god if for no other reason that would be reason enough to praise him We offer our praise to God, and usually the the tout of the thanksgiving in the Old Testament, it involved praise, but it involved sacrifice, that they would bring an animal, an offering to the Lord in thanksgiving. So as we're going to talk about in a minute, not that we bring an animal sacrifice, but but there's going to be something accompanying our words of thanksgiving. But we're entering, we're drawing nigh to God. When we're truly thankful to Him, we don't want to leave anything between we're truly thankful to the Lord, we don't want any sin, we don't want any selfishness, any resistance to the Spirit to get between us and the Lord. We want to cast all that aside that we may enter into His presence fully and wholeheartedly to praise and worship Him. So we want to confess, repent of any sin, anything unpleasing in our lives that we may draw ever nearer in His presence. We are thankful to Him, we bless His name, we, we proclaim it. We give praise directly to God, but we bless his name, not just to him, but we bless it to others. Let's turn back to Psalm 34, 1. Probably familiar to many of us. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth doesn't say, I'll bless him Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening. I'll bless him when I'm amongst believers. I'll bless him when things are going well. I will bless, and that means ascribe glory and honor to God. I will do this at all times, in all circumstances, in all companies. Yes, we look forward to rejoicing in his courts 
during the, the golden age of the millennium and think how wonderful that will be, but we can bless him in the same way in the midst of life's hardships. Once again, because of who he is, we know that he is God and he is in control and works all things to our good. So, the action of thanksgiving, we sing to the Lord. Secondly, we serve the Lord. Verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with thanksgiving. I didn't have to shoehorn this in here, it's right there. Serve the Lord. We're going to do. As I said, the word, the Hebrew word for thanksgiving, it often implies that, that a sacrifice or some kind of action is accompanying the praise. So the word calls for action. This is a psalm of, we have it, a psalm of praise. It could be a psalm of thanksgiving, which is going to be accompanied by the, the peace offering in, in the, the Israeli sacrificial system. So we, we offer things to the Lord. We offer our service, our obedience to him. Let's look at the book of Leviticus. Look, speaking of these offerings, let, let, let's look at the peace offering here. Leviticus chapter 7. Now, when it's describing the offerings, first it's the sweet savor offerings. Those are the voluntary ones. And then it's the, the sin and trespass offering. But the, the, the peace offering is last because that's the worship in light of all these other things, Lord. Now I bring the peace offering to you. Leviticus 7, 11, and 12. And this is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offering which he shall offer to the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer it with the sacrifices of thanksgiving. Unleavened cakes mingled with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. If they're going to offer thanksgiving, there's going to be an offering. Not just the, the, the word, but there is going to be action to accompany that. Thanksgiving will flow out of God's forgiveness and peace with him. That's why it comes after the sin and the trespass offering. When our sin has been dealt with, when our guilt before the Lord is, is taken care of, then we can wholeheartedly come before him with praise and thanksgiving. But we don't offer an animal, but we can serve. Our activity of praise doesn't stop with our mouth. It compels the rest of us to do, to serve. The, the word comes from the root of work. It's going to be literal, physical activity. The, the word to serve carries the idea of a bond servant. That if we are truly thankful to God, we will evermore be bound and submitted into his will for our lives. We said there at the beginning, John 14, 15, Christ said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. If we love him, if we're thankful to him, we will keep his commandments. We will do his will. We will serve. But how are we supposed to serve the Lord? With gladness. Just like our worship, the Lord doesn't want our service to be long-faced and forced and, well, I know I need to serve the Lord, so I'm going to do it. It should be with gladness, glee, excitement, joy, even pleasure. We should be blessed and have pleasure in what we get to do for the Lord. Just like singing, our service has precedence in being joyful over skillful. Whatever God calls you to, he will gift and enable you for that. So if he calls you to do something, do it. As we said in revival, pull the trigger. Don't worry about laying it all out and getting it all right ahead of time. When the Lord prompts you, you need to act. Just last week I was talking to Joe about Operation Christmas Child. We were talking about the good things, and, but there was challenges and some things we, we wish we'd known. And, but I praise the Lord that we jumped in and we did it this year. We, we didn't say, well, let's do a study on that. Let's have a, a committee and a council and, and we'll figure everything out possible. We felt led of the Lord and we did it. We pulled the trigger. We did it gladly. And yes, we'll learn and, and improve things, but we had opportunity to let the Lord work. We serve the Lord with gladness. We come before his presence with singing. Like worship, our service needs to have focus. It's not just a, a flurry of activity. 
sometimes we, we like to measure busyness. We, we measure activity instead of, of focus and results. But it, it needs to be focused on the Lord's will and be done as before Him. How often do we say, I'm going to serve the Lord, I'm going to do things for the Lord, but I'm the one that decides what I do, when I do it, where I do it. It all is according to me, but I say, oh, it's to the Lord. Friend, that's not how it works. We need to be open to His will and His direction, His leading, and serve when and how He dictates. And our worship and our service need to go together. It's not, here's my worship time, here's my serving time. We worship the Lord by serving Him, and we should have joy and worship in our service. The, the two shouldn't be separated. We don't go out and serve and then come before the Lord. The Lord's everywhere. All of our service is done in His presence and before Him. So we need to keep that in mind with our actions and our attitudes when we serve Him. And then likewise, how many times is it that while we're worshiping Him, that's when He really moves in our hearts and, and leads us into the service that He would call us to. When that happens, we need to act upon it immediately. Whether he's just, maybe it's something as simple as praying. He leads us to pray for somebody, do it immediately. He calls us to action, do it immediately. While we serve, we praise the Lord. Two sides of the same coin. Because when we praise the Lord while we serve, then the, the focus is off of us and on to Him. How often are we serving and we're self-conscious about it and thinking, well, what will other people think? Or think, wow, I'm, I'm really doing a great thing here, this and that. If we're worshiping the Lord while we're doing it, the, the focus is on Him, which is where it ought to be. That keeps us from rely, relying on our own strength. That keeps us from being prideful in what the Lord is doing from us. It keeps us from being burnt out. If we try to serve the Lord in our own strength, we're going to get burnt out. But what if we're serving according to His leading and direction and praising Him with, us, with it? He's going to provide the power and the strength to do it. And if we're praising the Lord when we serve, that ensures that others aren't going to be focused on, wow, what a great person that is. It's, wow, what a great God they have. If we do an activity as a church, or if we go out and serve, if, if people meet us, and if what people know about Grace Bible Church is, oh, so-and-so goes there, or, or, oh, Pastor Hikes preaches a certain way, or this is how they do things, we're missing the, the objective. What people need to know about Grace Bible Church is that they have a great God and Savior, and they love the Lord. That is what other people ought to know first and foremost about us. So we're going to sing to the Lord, we're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to study the Lord. Verses 3 and 5. Know ye, ah, there it is, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are called to know God. The idea there is the idea of, of knowing by, by seeing it happen and by experiencing it. We, we see God work. God is just so far beyond us as an infinite being, but beyond our, our comprehending that, that there's no way we can have any concept of, of most of God's attributes of how creation came to be if he didn't tell us. But praise the Lord that he did. He gave us his direct special revelation to man in the Bible. We know that Jesus is God in the flesh. He clearly stated it. The, bio, the biblical authors, they attest to it. Man never would have come up with the Trinity on his own. Man never would have come up with that God became man. He was holy God and holy man and, and died for people. We know that because God revealed it to us. But the more we know about God, the more we can and should be amazed by Him, be thankful to Him, and praise Him. The more we know about God, the more we can rightly praise Him. Thanksgiving here should drive a thirst for knowledge about God. Then as we understand more, we should be more thankful to God and just a vicious cycle. We'll keep going, understanding more and praising God more. What, what a glorious thing to do. And I think that we'll have the millennium and have all eternity to do that. We should seek to know 
the Lord. Well, how can we do that? Primarily through His Word. Hearing the Word preached. Studying in our own. Going to Bible studies. But then also, we learn God by experience. By serving Him once again. By living these things out and seeing Him work in our own lives. There's a Greek philosopher, Thucydides. And he's the one that said, the society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. I think the church has a similar danger when we separate our theologians from our worship leaders and our our hymn writers. That we think, well, here's the box of of praise and worship over here and here's the box of of serious thinking and, and study of God over here. The two need to be done together. If those are separate, we're going to have cold, lifeless sermons and lessons, and we're going to have empty songs of praise. I was thinking the the, the classic example, think think of the Wesley brothers and and the beautiful hymns that they wrote, but but just the denseness of theology in them. So that's, as we sing praise and worship, yeah, there might be songs that have a good beat and make us feel good, but, but what are we truly expressing about God in those? The the two are our praise and our theology. And if you're a believer in Christ Jesus today, you're called to be a theologian whether you know it or not. You're called to study God. You're called to know about Him. You're called to have an answer to everyone that asks. So yes, we need to to praise God and worship Him, but that's going to go hand in hand with our ever-increasing knowledge of Him. But again, the knowledge of God, it can't stop with book learning. It's going to come from experience too. We have God's general revelation in creation. As we walk outside, there's something in our heart that says that this didn't just happen. There's something in our heart that says there is something greater than me and even greater than this earth. Creation tells the human heart there is a creator and that he must be great and that he must be good said there's a danger separating our our theologians from our hymn writers. There's another danger if we separate our our theologians from from our servants in the church. That some people, we want to get in our ivory tower and just study more and more of God and maybe write books and tell others. And then the other people, they say, well, I don't need to know all that. I'll just go out and serve. Once again, the two need to go hand in hand. We're all theologians called to know God, but we're also all bondservants of the Lord called to to physically serve Him and know Him in a greater way through this service. We look at our lives and we see God's active hand and sometimes we need to look back to see that. Sometimes we don't see God in the moment and then we look back and say, my, how He directed that. My, how He guided my path. He put that person in in my life. We know Him in a greater way by what He has done. We know in a greater way of how He works And then, again, we become more thankful to him for his work on our behalf and his work in us. He's our creator. He's our redeemer. We should live our life in service and in worship in light of both. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us in all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We have access to all spiritual blessings. Everything you need to live the Christian life is at your fingertips if you will yield to the Lord and ask Him for them. We have access to all these, but we don't necessarily appropriate them all. Sometimes we keep the blessings of God on ice. That maybe I'll need that some other day. Maybe, maybe I, I hold that in store, God. Maybe, maybe I'll get around to that at some point. Even food in the freezer goes bad eventually. We, we need to, to live this out. We need to use the blessings of God that we may be used of Him. We may glorify Him evermore. Verse 5. For the Lord is good His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Isn't that great? Why do we praise Him? All these, there's these seven commands. 
Why? Because the Lord is good. Mm. We see the goodness of God in our own lives by experience. But we can see His goodness in the lives of others too. That's why we have the church to to share experiences and and fellowship and and see God working in the life of another and maybe speaks to how He works in ours. We have the great heroes of the faith, Christian biographies to study God's working in the lives of other people. Mm, What a a blessing that is. We we can't become so self-centered that we think that that the way God worked in me is the only way He can work. It it helps broaden our our ideas of God and our experiences seeing how He works in other people's. But the Lord is good. He is good in, in the broadest possible sense. He is good objectively, morally, emotionally, practically. Any way we can think, He is good. He is good. And then what a blessing that we, back in verse 3, that we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. God is good and He saved us. By the blood of Christ, He redeemed us and we are the sheep of His pasture. Once again, we have those blessings at our fingertips. You are God's sheep if you know Christ is your Savior, and He wants you to be able to say the 23rd Psalm. We think we talk to other people and, and they have struggles and trials in our lives and things aren't turning out the way they want. They're really reflecting on their shepherd who is governing their lives, whether it's themselves, indirectly, it's Satan. They say, oh, I'm led through the briar patch. I'm, I'm led through the stormy waters. And we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we, metaphorically, we want, he wants us to go through all those things and, and realize the care and protection he gives us from his goodness. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth is endures to all generation. The person of God is eternal. The goodness of God is eternal. So we should be eternally thankful. Our thanksgiving shouldn't depend on our circumstances. Because God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, right? So whether things are going the way we expect or the way we think they ought to, We know God is good and worthy of thanksgiving. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations. Often mercy and truth are held in tension like like they're fighting. The truth is often seen as unmerciful. The the truth is is harsh and and rough. I mean, when the truth comes out, there's no wavering on that. It is how it is. Often, on the other hand, people seek seek mercy by concealing the facts. We we don't want to bring the hammer down on a situation, so so we hide what truly happened. But God brings both. God is true. God is holy. God is righteous. God cannot accept sin. God is perfect. He is and sets the true standard. He sets reality. He sets morality. But He is also merciful to us. He does not give us the judgment of hell that we deserve because of the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ makes God true and merciful that he can be both to us. That he can be totally true. God can't, he is true, so he can't just ignore our sin. He can't just overlook it and act like it never even happened. But by the blood of Christ, he can be true. But he sees that sin is judged and he is merciful and gracious towards us. God can show mercies to sinners. Hmm. He gives blessings where a curse is warranted. Our wages, the right payment for our life, which is sin, is death. But he gives us the gift of God, which is eternal life. He gives us a blessing where a curse is deserved. His truth and mercy will not change. We don't need to worry about him changing the standard. We don't need to worry about, uh, well, what worked in the past doesn't work now. His mercy and truth don't change. They endure to all generations. They're always the same, but yet in a blessed way, they are new to every generation. We don't just need to look back at the pilgrims 400 years ago and say how good God was to them and how gracious. We can look in 2023 and say how good and truthful and merciful the God is to me. We we don't need to be, and we shouldn't be content 
with the mercy and truth God showed to the pilgrims. We shouldn't be content with the mercy and grace God showed to our parents. We should seek his mercy and his truth new to us because his mercies are new every morning. The praise shouldn't just be what happened in the past. We make the praise our own every day. We serve him ourselves every day. We seek to know more about him ourselves each and every day. Friend, that is true thanksgiving. We've seen what are the actions. Thanksgiving. We're going to sing to the Lord. We are going to make that joyful noise. It's going to, it's going to bubble over. It's going to be spontaneous because we are so thankful of him. It's got to come out. We're going to serve the Lord. We won't just be content to sit and sing. We're going to be compelled to do for the Lord, to go out and serve him. So we read the, the love of Christ constrains us, constrains us in these things. And third, we're going to be led to study the Lord. We're going to be so thankful that we're going to want to know more about him. When you love someone, you want to know more about them. As we love and are thankful to the Lord, we study him and we realize so many more things that we should be thankful to him for. And the cycle continues. Thanksgiving to God, it can't be limited to one day. It, it needs to be a lifestyle. It needs to be constant. It's going to start with an attitude. It's going to start with truly recognizing God for who he is and what he has done. But that attitude is going to burst forth out of our life. It's going to burst forth in song. It's going to burst forth in action. It's going to burst forth in study of the Lord. It's going to empower our service. It's going to encourage our study. Friend, today, think of all the Lord has done for you. Think about it. Ponder it. And then think, do these things characterize my life? Does song, does service, does study of the Lord characterize my life? If not, I ask you why. First, can you praise the Lord as both your creator and your redeemer? Have you ever personally received that second part by faith, receiving Christ as your Savior? As you work, as you, your life continues, are you trying to take credit for things that are only a gift of the Lord? Well, you can make a commitment today, friend, this Thanksgiving season and all year. Will you truly do the actions of Thanksgiving in your life? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for who you are, that you are almighty God, all-powerful, that you are good, that you are gracious, that you are true and merciful. We thank you for all you do for us, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit in the hearts of believers. And I pray that even now he would be speaking to our hearts and helping us to realize where we are not singing, serving, studying like we ought to. Lord, we thank you for Christ Jesus and the death on the cross that pays for our salvation. If there's one here that has never, by faith, believed that he died and rose again, confessed their sins and received him as Savior, I pray that you would speak to their heart too and that even today they would seek to do that. Lord, help us to have a good Thanksgiving. Keep us safe as we travel. Give us joy in time with family, Lord, but help us to never lose our focus on you, that we would truly worship you as we are. Work and move in this time, Lord. We love you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord spoke to your heart. There's an area where you are not thankful to the Lord as you ought. You're not showing it as you ought. The altar's open as Denny leads us in our closing hymn.